So yeah, I guess um, a little uh, fleshing that out. I, my training is in ethics. I'm in the Department of Theology at St. Peter's University here in Jersey City. Um, I'm a fellow of the UNESCO Chair in uh, Bioethics and Human Rights, where I work primarily with um, on a project on bioethics, multiculturalism, and, um, and interfaith dialogue. Uh, today, uh, given my background in ethics, I tend to be more of a virtue ethicist, even though I, I do some uh, comparative work. And um, I don't want it to just be me talking, right? Um, this is my uh, money the coming up to the mic, but I want to hear from you guys. I'm going to pose a number of questions. Uh, I want to brainstorm a little in this kind of workshop sense of the, the workshop, right? Uh, so I do want to hear from you guys, so please participate. Um, and I really want to explore today uh, the themes of virtue, law in both a moral sense, uh, law, the way in which law in the secular sense, the secular laws might frame our ethical thinking in a clinical context, um, and the idea from theology of transfiguration, the transformation of self, the metamorphosis um, that a life in Christ it calls um, Christians to, to engage in um, and try to connect some of these themes and brainstorm with you guys about some of these uh, themes. So that's my little intro. Any, any questions so far? <laughs> okay, that's not applicable. Oh, sorry. I'd like to uh, begin uh, by exploring some orthodox moral theology or aspects of orthodox uh, ethics. And then as we progress, um, look at themes um, getting closer to, to medical ethics, kind of ending with actually looking at Emma's uh, principles of ethics and trying to explore them from an orthodox moral perspective. So law as the schoolmaster of virtue the Ten Commandments, or uh, more adequate translation, the Ten Declarations from the Hebrew that God spoke, right? The Decalogue, as the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, as cited in Galatians. Well, what, can this, what, what does this mean for our moral lives? We often think about morality in terms of rules to follow, in terms of laws, when we think about moral law, sometimes we think about obedience to a law, law as being commanded, right? However, if we think of why, why obey these laws, right? Christianity does not transcend the Mosaic law, right? It does not transcend the commandments, but fulfills the commandments in a sense. But why are these commandments given? Are they given as just follow them because I said or follow them because there is a purpose, right? Within Christianity as a whole, but especially within Orthodoxy, there's this idea that Christ comes to fulfill the law, right? There's a purpose to this law, and there's a purpose to um, moral laws in this sense that go beyond just obeying the letter of the law, right? So... Um, what I have up on this slide, some of these points, are that abiding by moral laws can teach one how to act so that a person may truly begin to habituate these sorts of actions, right? And through this habituation of action, actually cultivate the types of psychological dispositions, right, that we need to make acting in such a way second nature, right, to actually come to embody virtuous traits. Virtue ethics is always going to ask, what is the good? What is the good person? And emphasize what is the good person over what is the right thing to do. Both will come into the paradigm, but there's this emphasis on character. Right? The idea of law being the schoolmaster of virtue is that the law here is a framework, a guideline to help bring one to a state of virtue. The Mosaic law is understood strictly in contractual terms, right, or any ethics in terms of contract and just 
letter of the law. It leads to the view that ethics is primarily about rules, duties, and obligations. Essentially, an action-oriented uh, discipline or an act action-oriented approach to ethics called deontology. Deon meaning duty in Greek. Oloia, the study of duties. Right? However, if we look at the Decalogue, these divine declarations, right, in another sense, as serving as a guide for the cultivation of character traits um, and a relationship with God as well as others, right, it leads to a more virtue-oriented approach where we're looking to cultivate dispositions. We're motivated not by, am I obeying the law or why is this law given? Right? How can I become a better person? How can I become a good person? And I hope to flesh this out a little more with the next slide. The idea that the Mosaic law, which is this ethical law, is actually fulfilled through agape, right? Through love. The idea that Christ came to fulfill rather than abolish the law, love of God and love of neighbor, when asked what is the most important part of the law? Christ responds and says, love God and love your neighbor, citing Leviticus. Some uh, scholars, theologians, ethicists, like to talk about this as the Christian law of love. I like to think about it more of the love ethic, an agape ethic. What is so special about the term agape, though, in the Greek, that the English word love doesn't always capture Agape was a term used by the pre-Christian Hellenics in a way, very rarely. They spoke about philia, loving friendship. They spoke about eros, which is not just erotic, but this more being in love. And they spoke about agape very rarely as this divine, unconditional love for humans. When Christians adopt this term, it's very self-conscious. It's a specific kind of love. It's unconditional. Right? It's, div it's mimicking divine love. Right? It's this all-encompassing love. So that if simply acting dutifully and abiding by the morals of the Mosaic Law right, means that you're good, then all you have to do is don't murder. Don't be an adulterer. Don't steal, right? Acknowledge one God. But maybe in your heart, you're like, mm, you're doing it begrudgingly. Agape means transforming that. You're not going to do what the law says begrudgingly. Right? The point is to get to a place where you naturally are in, you're coinciding and aligned. Your behavior is aligned with the law without having a, a deep struggle about it. Right? Essentially, if just abiding by these laws is sufficient, there's no need for Christ, the Christos, to fulfill the law. Right? And that's where um, I emphasize a more virtue-oriented approach, one that does not knock away deontology or rights, duties, and obligations talk, but one that will emphasize areti, virtue, excellence, right? excellence of character excellence of personhood. So, I quote Galatians again, uh, St. Paul, before faith came, we were confined under the law. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. It's that the purpose of this law is to be this schoolmaster. Right? In a certain sense, um, anyone, anybody who was in the psychology one in this room before lunch there's a sense in which we're immature. Right? In the plenary today, this idea of growing, right? try to connect into things that I didn't know were going to be said. Right? But this idea that we need to grow and that the law on the moral level, right? on the level of ethics, helps us grow, helps teach us right? the kinds of habits we need to alter our dispositions, to start to transfigure our hearts, our minds. Right? Our psyche means soul in Greek, spirit. Right? The agape ethic entails the transfiguration of self in this sense. Right? It's a process of becoming. Right? 
not just a process, ethics is not just a process of abiding, abiding by or obeying, right? It's not just about correct actions, but about transforming ourselves. Right? So it begins with this sort of obedience to rules that are intended to ins- assist by teaching us these habits, by transforming ultimately our hearts and minds and essentially our ontology, our being. Right? Um, ethics in this deeper virtue ethics sense is deeply personal. It's deeply ontological. Right? You're striving for a vision of who you're going to become. What is the good person? Who am I? Who do I want to be? It's a matter of being. Right? Ethics can't be divorced from ontology in this sense. Back to virtue versus deontology. So, virtue coming from the Latin, meaning moral excellence, and is really concerned, as I just said, with what it means to be a good person. These good and bad, or uh, beautiful and ugly uh, dispositions and character traits that we're really focusing on. A deontological paradigm coming from theon in Greek, meaning duty or obligation, is really concerned with the right thing to do these right and wrong actions and behavior. And what I'd like to uh, postulate is that the good is actually prior to the right. The political philosopher John Rawls said the right is prior to the good. I would counter that. I think the good, ton kalon, the good, is prior to the right. In the sense that correct action, in, this, in, in an orthodox ethical sense, is that which best contributes to one's pursuit of being good, becoming excellent, having this um, pursuit of ultimately theosis, right? This closeness with the divine, right? This uh, seeking out divinization. So that what is good frames uh, what is right. And when we are morally young, so to speak, or beginning on the path, we need these laws to help get us to the good. But is ultimately the good. Right. Do I have to interrupt you? Here? Yeah. Can I have a comment on that? Of course. So I think I mean I think it's it's like one leads to the other, leads back to the other, leads back to the other. So sometimes I think we do things for the wrong reasons, actually, but they help us be better, and then we maybe do something for the right reason that helps us be better, and then we and so there's a back and forth. So I'm not sure. I would say that one necessarily leads to the other. I would say that they go hand in hand, back and forth. That's what it feels like to me. I think that's what ends up happening as we're on the path, right? As we're on this struggling path to become better, right? To achieve um, an excellence that we might never fully achieve, right? Um, And as we stumble back, uh, what I mean is that by the good being prior to the right in this sense is that um, the right thing to do only makes sense in this context of what is goodness. And from a theological point of view, if we're thinking of um, God as goodness, right? And. Um, you would say I say the opposite too, though. I mean, sometimes I can do the right and it makes me be better. So it brings the good about, even if the good wasn't there. So I think both. Go, I, I don't know, think about it some, but that's what I would argue. I, I get what you're saying in our personal lives. I, I would say that the reason that moral laws or the ideas of right actually exist is to get us to a place where we're good persons, right? Um, so that, and I'm going to kind of get to this in the oh, next slide. So hopefully, hopefully um, this idea of back and forth is definitely going to be operative, right? I'm not trying to cut deontology or what philosophers call deontology or a duty-based or legal-based um, ethical framework at all, right? Um, which some virtue theorists do. They just want to talk about virtue, right? I do want that interplay, right? Um, I just don't think that the, the law or duties, right? Just upholding duties without ultimately seeking to have the proper disposition. So you might do something for the wrong reason, right? So my duty says that I must take care of my dying father, okay? Yes. And I'm doing it because it's a duty. Not because I actually believe in my heart it's good. But you know what? 
in the process of doing it, I am transformed. And I now I'm doing it for the right reasons. Okay, so yeah. I've, I've changed. Well, and that's how duties, obligations, rules, right, laws can help teach us. Right? That's exactly what I'm talking right, about. Right, but I think we also make, it goes the opposite way too. I mean, I think we choose to be good people and therefore that governs what we do. So I do think there's an interplay. But it sounds like you're saying the same thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to focus on the idea that at the end of the day, in a virtue paradigm, we're asking what is the good person. And, and someone who isn't the moral exemplar yet can still do good things, right? Hopefully the next slide. I saw another hand, though. Uh, no, yeah. I was just trying to, the way I understand what you're saying is that when you said that you do the, the right thing and that makes you be good, that you were actually, uh, uh, the goodness was there before, you just acknowledge it after you do the right thing. That's sort of like what you're trying to say. So the goodness is there, and then when you do the right thing and it leads you to goodness, but the goodness was there before, you just didn't know it. You, you didn't know it was there. To some extent, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's this idea that things are, we consider them right because they lead to some good, right? Or the good. Um, so that even if we're just begrudgingly upholding a duty, right, but it can transform us, that's the way the duty is the schoolmaster. The reason that duty makes sense is because of a conception of goodness right, that might even be beyond us, that we might realize later, but it might pre-exist us. Right? We might not have gotten there yet, but that was, that's why that's a duty. Right? begrudgingly taking care of somebody and then finding relationality, right, and having your disposition altered. That was a good thing. That's the right action, even if you're not doing it, to find relationality. Just, I have to do this. If that can transform you, that's exactly how rules, duties, obligations can be that schoolmaster. Right? So, I mean, I do want that interplay. Yeah, but in the mission center, I, mean, I don't want to belabor this, but I'll just right. say, in the mission discussion the other day, um, lots of times, kids, adults go on mission trips because they want to be the cool person, they want to be acknowledged for being, you know, wonderful outreach. Totally wrong reasons and not even a rule, not even a rule. Okay. And they go yep. there and they're changed by it. And now they're actually there for the right reasons. So I, I'm, I, I think, I do think there's an You know what, I think the next slide, because okay, okay. Phil philosophically... I, I another word. Yeah, no, but I get, what, I get what you're saying. And before I turn to the next slide, right? Whether it's in our daily life or whether it's um, in philosophical discourse or theological discourse, we just want to talk about right and wrong, good and evil, right? Good and bad, if we don't like the term evil, right? There are dimensions and degrees. And um, I've argued, actually, in uh, an article that's forthcoming in a book on Christianity and bioethics, or religion and bioethics, the chapter on Christianity, that there's a sense in which there are degrees, right? It's not so black and white. It's not just good and bad. And that's part of what a virtue paradigm is, right? If there's excellence, right, it's not just, okay, now you're good, now you're bad. There's something in the middle. And what we don't talk about enough anymore is decency, which I'm going to be getting to. Um, this, I'll go over quickly, because then that's where I want to get to, which will hopefully answer... Um, and that's what I want to hash out with you guys. So there's this part of virtuosity being self-transfigurative, right? We all realize Christiani as an actual term, right? Um, when the first Christians were called this, and Antioch means little Christ, one who imitates Christ and strives to be Christ-like in a perpetual self-transfiguration. A virtue ethics in the sense that it is about this process of becoming is very in line with even the etymological understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Right? Christianity, in a sense, is not just, an Orthodox Christianity is not just about co what you cognitively believe. In America, we tend to think of religion as belief. It is about being. Right? It is about being in a certain way. And the faith is about this process of becoming. And that's why this virtue ethics is about mimicking the virtuous person. When Aristotle spoke about virtue ethics, he said, think about the most excellent person you knew. The early Christians were like, we know, 
who that person is. We don't have to just imagine somebody. Right? It is Christ. That fits with this idea of being a Christiani, right? This uh, mimicking, this imitation, right? Trying to make yourself Christ-like. And that's part of that transformation of your actual dispositions. That's part of the struggle. That's part of the path. Ethics is not easy. Right? We all want to be a good person and say, yes, I'm good. I'm good now. No, we're all constantly struggling to be good and become excellent, right? On that level. And this is where I want to talk about decency, not just virtuosity. <coughs> and so there's this sense that we don't really talk about being decent anymore. And there's nothing wrong with being decent. Right? Now, the way we use decent is, oh, that was a decent slice of pizza, but it's not an excellent slice of pizza. Right? That was a decent steak, but I know of a better steak. There was a time in which, even in English, we used the term decent, like, what a decent person. As not meaning like, oh, you know, that's half bad. It was, no, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Right? And this idea of a hierarchy, right? Or not even a hierarchy, but at least dimensions or degrees of, of goodness, right? That you can't just go from being bad to being good capital G, good in this perfection way, that annihilates the struggle of self-transfiguration. Right? If you act good and you think of yourself as good now, where is there to go? But within the Christian paradigm, you're always going somewhere. You're always in a process of becoming. Even when theologians speak about theosis, it's a perpetual idea. You don't just like, boom, chief theosis, check, done, right? Divinization. No, right? It's this process. It's this struggle. And that's what I'm trying to highlight here. Part of this idea of the schoolmaster is being decent, I propose, is correlated with this being dutiful. Or maybe sometimes having some wrong dispositions or dispositions that will miss the mark, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Performing duties, upholding obligations. You're a decent person. You didn't break the law. Let's take some of the good, hard ones that most people agree on from the Mosaic Law, even trans-religiously and transculturally. Right? Don't murder. Right? But one can begrudgingly refrain from murdering somebody. Right? One cannot murder and be in accord with the law, but in their heart of hearts, be murderous. Like, Shucks, if it wasn't against the law, so would have murdered that person. Or, hmm, it's against the law, the only reason I didn't murder the person is because I'm going to get caught. Selfishness. Wrong disposition. Correct outcome. You didn't murder. But would we really call someone who refrains from murdering because of selfishness, fear of getting caught, or even just a desire to be a law abider, actually good. If the most Christ-like and excellent person or person trying to become excellent is someone following a rapi, right? the true disposition to refrain from murder is going to be coming from love of God, love of neighbor. Not just, I want to listen to the law. Disposition to be law-abiding. Not enough. Disposition, selfish, afraid, not enough. Cowardice is a vice in virtue theory. Courage right, is the virtue. Arrogance is the vice on the other extreme. Virtue is that moderate place. Courage is moderate in that sense, that it's not selfish, it's not cowardly. Right? The virtuous person, the excellent person that we're trying to mimic or trying to become is never murderous. When we think about a prohibition on murder, its purpose is to teach us to no longer have murderous desires in our heart. It's to overcome those murderous desires, to take those desires and get rid of them, not have them. And that is the moral psychology operative right, in virtue theory. And that is the moral psychology 
right? Or theological psychology, or this ethical, spiritual transfiguration that needs to happen, right? Overcoming those desires, trying not to have them, being in a state where you do not have them, right? Or if they come up, they immediately go away, right? So virtuosity is the striving for excellence. Right? It's acting in accord with the law, not because God said so, or the state said so, if we think about other laws right? uh, in a secular state. Right? But it's not obeying by the moral law because God said so, but because one is now predisposed to act in that manner. You've changed your dispositions. You're no longer murderers. You would never dream of being adulterous. You don't envy the other person's thing, so you're not going to try to steal it. It's not, shucks, wish I could steal that thing. But God said not to. Think of children learning rules. Parents have to give them rules with the hope that they're not just going to have these rules in their head, but become better people by first listening to the rules. This is where rule-based ethics is essentially the first stage. It is not the end-all, be-all of the ethical life, of the truly moral life. And just following rules on that level is almost, you know, the immature ethics. And, and it's supposed to get us somewhere. So where we want to get is that, you know, refraining from murder, right? refraining from... Um, uh, adultery, but also being compassionate. You're not being compassionate because God said be compassionate. Right? Love is not something that you can do like not murdering. Love your neighbor. Love God. You can't begrudgingly love. You can't begrudgingly have agape in your heart because it's about what's in your heart. That's the, the emphasis I'm trying to make. So when you have someone doing something for the wrong reason, they could be decent, but would we call them virtuous? Virtue is a loaded term. It means excellence. Right? A virtue ethics, we're always recognizing there's something we're striving for. Right? And the humility, the humble thing to do is, you would never say, I am virtuous in a virtue paradigm, right? So that there's this idea of going beyond the call of duty, right? Going beyond the call of duty if the duty is to, um, you have a duty, an obligation, you made a promise, now you're obliged, but you're begrudging, begrudgingly doing it. Really, the call of virtue is the call of going beyond duty. It's going above and beyond the bare minimum of just going through the motions, upholding the action. It's trying to alter who you are. Right? Does that make a little more sense than what from the earlier question, right? And so they're, they, they're aligned with one another and there will be interplay. There's going to be a fallback because right? we never become perfect. Right? But it's this different uh, relationship with Rules and laws and duties. While well, English translations of many Orthodox prayers use the term transgression, um, the idea of amartia, sin in Greek, captures something that when sin gets translated, well, sin is Latin. In the sin of Latin, it's left. Sinistra, right? It's this transgression model. But there's something that it's, if it's just about law and breach of law, if it's just about contracts like duties and promises, it's about breach of contract is sinful. Breach of the law is sinful. But if that is supposed to teach us something to get fulfilled, its purpose to be fulfilled, sin is truly missing the mark falling off the path, right? Amartia is like an archer, or let's say something that maybe is more common 
in today's society, playing darts, right? The idea of amartia in a paradigm of areti, virtue, is that even if you're really good, you hit that red bullseye on the dartboard, is it dead center? Perfectly? Perfectly in the center? No. You can be really good, but you're not perfect. That's some humility operative in virtue ethics. That, and even if you get the bullseye right now, in a few throws, you might miss it again. You might be on the board, you might be close. Right? And that's the point of this process, right? that there's this struggle. And amartia is missing the mark. Sin is missing the mark. Sinfulness is falling short of our ethical spiritual goals in this sense. It's not necessarily breaching laws when we think about <clears throat> the idea of morality in this, in this deeper process of transfiguration. <clears throat> the fallen human nature. Right? There's this idea that the Latins really introduced with St. Augustine, even though he's um, a saint in our church, influenced the Latin church much more, which now um, became the Roman Catholic Church. And there's this idea that flowed into Western theology of original sin, sin in the bloodline. The idea of the fall in this non-Augustinian way is more of our imperfections, our fallibility. And from the perspective of a, a virtue-based paradigm, this makes more sense, and it makes more sense with the call for transfiguration and the process of becoming, which the idea of theosis, the ultimate goal, um, also implies. Right? So rather than inheritance of depravity or inheriting evil in this way, it's about recognition of your imperfection, your fallibility, and our perpetual fallibility. So that, yeah, I can hit the mark this time, but I might miss it next time. I'm going to try to be compelled to hit the mark again. The virtue paradigm thus recognizes human imperfection and views the ethical life as a perpetual process of aiming towards the goal of who we're striving to become. Christ-like. Now I'm going to move into healthcare. But I was hoping to pause. We already started a little bit of a discussion and, um, and, and chat about this a little bit before we get into the, the health care, the medical side of this. Yeah. So um, I, I, I use that, a mark, yeah, I use it a lot. But there's one thing that seems important, and that is that there is, I think, an element of context in it that. Um, Knowing yourself and the person involved and the reasons and the, 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 are, are important. So you know you can go to these desert story, desert monk stories, and there's the desert father who, um, you know, go, goes off and he sins horribly, <coughs> goes to brothels, does all the rest of this stuff, and he runs up to his other brother monk who has been virtuous the entire time. And the brother monk said, and the, and the monk who sinned horribly says, "I can't go back. I can't go back to the monastery, monastery. I've done all these horrible things while I've been here." And his brother recognizes the problem, and he says to him, "You know what? He lies." And he says, "I've done the same thing as you have. I've committed the same things you have." And then the other monk can say, "Okay, then let us go back together to the monastery." So. So th this is an, where context is very, very important. And I think that that's sort of missing from this concept. I mean, so while it was wrong, maybe, for the guy to lie, in this context, it was actually correct because he recognized, he discerned in the brother monk what was the but right that, thing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. When we think about just duties, rules, laws, think about this Kantian paradigm, rational laws that are universal truth laws, right? Don't lie. Lying is wrong. No, it's contextual. In a virtue paradigm, you highlighted exactly what I'm trying to get at. Right? It's 
if you are this virtuous person, like you described the virtuous monk, the monk has reached a level on the path of virtue where it's not about like, oh, can't lie, that's a rule. No. My communication with this person is going to help bring them on that path of becoming as well. So lying in that context is okay. Right? So that it's not about a rule. Right? The original rules the monk learned as a child were there or in their early moral formation to help them get to exactly that point. Does that make sense? Right? Like, so he can lie because it's more about the disposition underlying the action than the particular action now. And that's what I'm critiquing the deontological paradigm or when it's only a deontological paradigm. I think you had your hand up. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly trying to think about this in the context of the fulfillment of the law through, let's say, um, you know, in Matthew when he says, you know, Moses said to you this, uh, but I, so Moses said to you, do not commit adultery, but I say unto you, um, he who commits adultery in his heart has already committed the sin. So like this idea of fencing in the law, um, so that there's this space in between the law and then that disposition. But that fence is, is, is love, I think, and, but also I'm trying to put it back into the context of, of your talk about good and, and, and virtue. So where in this analogy and, and in Matthew, where is the space for the good? Where is the good? That's an excellent question. So, I like that you use that example. Because again, that's, that's something I'm trying to get at. That, yeah, if you commit adultery in your heart, you've already committed the sin. Right? Even though you have not actually physically, actively, in behavioral space, broken the law yet. Right? And that's what I mean by having the right disposition. So that you don't even have in your heart, in your mind, uh, that urge come up. Right? You don't even have an urge to commit the adultery that you would have to now squash down. Right? Getting to that state right, where you do, you're not adulterous, right? you're just automatically compassionate, you're not murderous. That's the virtue paradigm. And that's what you need to be focusing on. So that... The good here is this, this state of excellence, right? This, this state of this perfection. And when taken within the Christian context, if there's this you know, understanding that there is a goodness, right? A divine goodness, its purpose that gets fulfilled through the law is that the law's purpose now is that schoolmaster, right? Goodness. It's not, it's not good because God said so. It's not good because there's the law. Goodness is divine. And that's what we're trying to get to. And that's what I mean that it, it comes prior. The law gets issued forth by the source of goodness to be the teacher so we can come to recognize goodness. And, and then another teacher comes that fulfills that by being the moral exemplar. The moral exemplar that all the pre- Christian, Hellenic, virtue, ethicists imagined, right? Imagine, Aristotle says, the most excellent person and try to be like them, right? This is the fulfillment of the law. Does that make sense, right? So that, are we ever going to achieve capital G, goodness, capital K, galon, kappa? <laughs> Right? Capital Kappa. Galon. No. Right? But that's what we're striving for. Right? So it's... But you hit the nail on the head on that example. Right? Like that's the point. Changing your heart. Did you? Uh, you didn't beat be me to it. I was going to say something about that passage in Matthew. Um, but it is interesting. And, and right before that, when Christ goes through the Beatitudes, that almost seems like a, a foil to the Decalogue using positive terminology instead of negative. So it's one thing to abstain from murdering, but then he's, you know, that whole pedicle piece seems to be like, no, you need to go out and do this. Blessed are the peacemakers, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, this and that. It, it takes action, not just begrudgingly abstaining from 
murdering your neighbor. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, but, from the ontology to a virtue ethic. I, I totally understand the Beatitudes in that sense as, well, meekness, right? Peacemakers, righteous. These are dispositions, character traits of characters. Right? They're character traits. Be like this. Right? It's not about, he doesn't say, you know, go feed the poor. Right? Go make peace. It's not action-oriented in that here's a duty, here's a new duty now. Right? It's blessed are these types of people. We're talking about traits characterizing the, the person. right? And that's, that's where this understanding of, okay, this is, this is the moral paradigm here. So, did, did anyone else want to make a comment? Or comment to someone else in the crowd? Yeah. I was, I was thinking of a question. It seems like, I think from what you've said so far, I could guess at the answer, is going back to the analogy of the dart game. If you're playing darts, you're trying to hit the bullseye. I was going to ask, what motivation does a person have to play the game to begin with? Why would they want to even hit the bullseye? Well, that's a, that's a whole like, other lecture. It seems like <laughs> that's your, a great your explanation kind of instances it like the law is kind of there to for, actually force you to play the game at first. And you then know, you kind uh, of, you, then you want to play the game, right? To some extent, right? I mean, um, I guess on, 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 the, on the level of like, why do you want to play the game? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's really loaded. Um, <laughs> if you're called into the life, right? Um, if you're called to the religious life, right? So... I'm presupposing, in, in this crowd at least, uh, that people have been called to, to, to you know, walk that path. Um, but even the, the idea you're saying that, yeah, right, you get this, this wall, right, like the kid gets a set of rules, and then over time realizes the purpose of them and realizes, okay, like, you're doing it begrudgingly as a kid, right, like, you're not taking the cookie out of the cookie jar, you're going to bed when you're told, then you're going to break them as soon as you have no you know, counselor or someone to watch over you, right? Uh, and then you're going to realize, oh, no, you start realizing why those rules were good, right? Or what they were intended for, what their purpose was. So that on that level, yeah, right, you'll, you'll come to it. Why you're going to start, you know, wanting to be good, I mean, I think even without a particular religious calling, right? Uh, people want to be good. Um, people want to think of themselves as good. We're naturally attracted to the good. Um, and from you know, the religious understanding, that's because the source of existence, the ground of being, is good. We're attracted back to that. Right? Um, even people who are not you know, an atheist will still want to be good, right? Um, so, but that, I can go on, I don't want that, I'm trying to cut myself short there, but that's a great question. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah. Oh. It's green, green. So, um, uh, you're really participating, I'm glad, yeah, I wanted to run a workshop where people talk, so, good. That makes me happy. Um, Evdaimonia and the aims of healthcare. The bioethicsy part of the, the lecture, right? So, who's this excellent person? Don Christon, right? Christ. And in uh, the Orthodox tradition, we refer to Christ as the great physician, right? In, in this sense, part of um, mimicking Christ. Right? The profession of being a physician, a clinician, a healer, right? a healthcare worker, um, someone working in healthcare service, right? uh, is naturally aligned. Right? Or that, that, that choice of career, that vocation, if you will, is naturally aligned with this idea of mimicking Christ. What are the aims of healthcare? I put up here the restoration of biopsychosocial wellness as a means of contributing to flourishing, evdaimonia. Um, if we have to translate that very uh, loaded word in, into one word in English, 
Really, it's this goodness indwelling within the spirit. That's what evdaimonia is. Some contemporary philosophers interpret it as happiness. It's not happiness. Right? It's like, uh, it's not what it means. Um, some level of joyousness, which is not just pleasure happy, uh, is implied. And that's why I prefer the term flourishing than happiness. But it's really goodness and dwelling within the spirit is the etymological breakdown. And a little caveat, I, I want to take the di- idea of psyche, psyche, and also imply a certain spiritual dimension, not just the cognitive way that we tend to use the term psyche as equivalent to mind cognitive in, in, in contemporary um, English. Right? So that part of the aims of healthcare is caring for health. Part of our health is our wellness. Well, our health is our wellness. But our wellness is not just our biology. Right? It's not just our um, psycho-spirituality. It's also our sociality, our relationality. Right? So that Really, the, the aims of healthcare on this larger level, when thought about from the perspective of eudaimonia, is about contributing to human flourishing on all these levels. So, authentic healthcare, as it was understood by, you know, uh, healthcare saints, right? Um, the way it's practiced by Jesus Christ, the healer himself. And the way we see it in St. Basil's, um, you know, early hospitals, hospices, right? That then flourishes through both Eastern and Western Christendoms becomes um, this larger eudaimonaic, uh, multifaceted uh, endeavor, not simply a repair job of a physical dysfunction. And today, right, modern medicine... It's not always guilty of this, but with the rapidity right, and the um, empiricalization, which have been very beneficial and can be very beneficial for helping to contribute to evdaimonia, leads to a tendency that we can slip off and just view um, health care as being a repair, right? the repair of the body. Or, okay, you know, um, psychology is for repair of the mind, and you can go talk to the priest and confess about something else. That these, we get stratified right, in our daily lives. We section off things rather than having a holistic view of ourselves, communities, society, and what different um, professions and different modes of healing can do. Right? It's like, no, no, you're just gonna, you're gonna repair my, you know, body. You're going to repair my soul. You're going to repair my mind. And I'm going to talk to, you know, politicians to repair the social world, right? Sort of thing. Um, No, there's this larger holism going on in the Orthodox understanding of being, of of being in in, in communion. Uh, It's the ground of of who we are as, as persons. And I want to say that the art of medicine, which I'm sure you've heard. Yeah. Two minutes left. Oh my god, really? I think we can go for I think we can go for five minutes beyond that. Um, sure. you know, just because we started late. Okay. I uh, I thought we were still gonna go on even though we started late. Sorry. Um, no, no, we are. We are. I'll give you the I'll give you two okay. minutes started, so it's five more minutes. Well I'm glad uh, we had some conversation about that. Anyway, I wanted to throw that out there because that's really important. This is what I want you guys to think about. Well what really is the good doctor? Um, these are more suggestions, right? One who's compassionate philanthropic in the sense of philanthropos, um, one who really is, has genuine loving kindness towards humanity. God is described as the great philanthropos. Courage, right? Um, a bravery that lacks the self-righteousness, honesty, fidelity, being trustworthy and candid with, with patience. Right? So thinking about that, are codes of even medical ethics able to serve as some sort of schoolmaster of clinical virtue? Um, understanding that when, when we're practicing as uh, physicians or clinicians, there's rules, there's lists of patients' rights all over the hospital. Right? You walk around, patients' rights, patients' rights. You've got to uphold the patients' rights in this duty-obligatory sort of sense. Right? 
got to do this, got to do that. This is the law, right? Got to practice CYA medicine, right? Got to cover it. Why? The law. How can functioning within that paradigm still be conducive to this sort of virtue approach that I'm talking about? And I wanted to um, pull some sort of things out um, from the principles of the American Medical Association's principles of medical ethics. And one is, the very first one, the physician shall be dedicated to providing competent medical care with compassion, respect for human dignity, and rights. I'm going to skip the rights for a moment and just highlight this idea for respect for human dignity is respect for the whole person. So that, yes, rights do always entail obligation. If a patient has a right and you're a clinician, you are obliged to act in a certain way towards them or to provide a certain service. Indeed. But if we're thinking about the patient as a whole person, right? And this goes back to that question. How can you go beyond the call of duty? Right? That's a decent ethical response. I'm accepting your rights. Here's your duties. Here you go. Right? It's very much this sort of transaction in a contractual way. How does virtue get cultivated while performing that profession? Right? And I'm not going to answer that. I want to put that out there as something to think about on this path of virtue. Um, How can we recognize persons as this hypostasis, this unity, this bio-psycho-social unity with psyche implying spirit, the spirituality, um, and this this paradigm in which the, the wellness of the person is not just their physical wellness. Again, coming back to decency of character and goodness of character. So I asked some questions what, uh, related to the last, the virtues of the good doctor. And are there any virtues that might be even specific to Orthodox Christian clinicians? What sort of virtues does the Orthodox faith call an Orthodox clinician to cultivate? I wanted to put that out there. Um, and really, we hear throughout the medical principles, responsibility. Right? Um, respect the law, recognize responsibility. Physicians shall recognize a responsibility to participate in improvement of the community. Responsibility to the patient is paramount. Responsibility, what is it? It's the ability to respond. Right? We often use responsibility in the sense of just do these obligations. But if we think about it in this more holistic sense, it's our capability as persons, to respond to another person, to respond to a context. And that's where our character comes into play. How do you respond to another? The need of the other, the call of the other, the suffering of the other. How do you respond to the difficult situation? Do you embrace it? Do you cower from it? This idea of responsibility as really being ability to respond. Right? Uh, with this concern for flourishing and well-being of persons and communities. So the questions I pose here that I'd like you guys to take, take home at this point is, what does being a responsible physician entail or clinician entail? And in what ways ought a clinician strive to even improve the community? Not just individual patients, but the community they live in, maybe even the hospital as a community of persons coming together with the common telos or or goal of uh, human wellness on that level. And I'm going to to end it there because I put up a couple questions. There's a few more slides, but yes. Um, Do you see this um, evidence-based medicine, performance measures, economics, is that a one-way train or is it on a pendulum swing which might come back? Because I'm not seeing any evidence of it wanting to come back out from the Veterans Hospital and just getting tighter and tighter. I think if we don't... That's why I want to address those ideas of community, right? Because it becomes very hard to address one individual person when the institutional and systemic um, context that we're in pushes um, individual clinicians to be more empirical, to be fast-paced, to treat people like a number, right? Get that dialysis done, we got to get someone else, right? We see that all the time, and that's why I really highlighted, even in this, you know, non-orthodox AMA's um, 
medical ethics, this idea of community, improve the community. And that's part of, yeah, it's not just about dispositions. What do dispositions lead to? Actions. So I'm not, no action-based ethics, of course not, right? But it's that disposition that cultivates, okay, I'm working with this patient. I see I'm trying to respect them in this way. What systemic problems are interfering with that relationality? And how can I now <coughs> attempt to change it? And of course, one person, one man or woman cannot do it on their own. So it takes community to change that. And, um, and that's something I wanted us to, to think together about. And I want to bring up, this, so if you look at like number seven up there, which is about improving, improvement of the community, I mean, there is another responsibility that doesn't come out well in these guidelines, and that is um, the responsibility that the physician has for the community. I mean, the physician cannot turn out a person with a rare infectious disease to go out and yeah. invest the community, right? The physician, uh, the psychiatrist can't turn out somebody who they think is a mass murderer. So it, it is, it, it's not just, I mean, so I think these guidelines, when I've looked them over many times, they seem to focus on the patient relationship with the physician, but the physician does have a relationship to community. Yes. And I think it doesn't come out well in these. I mean, Southern says it a little bit, but I'm not sure it does. No, and that's exactly, you know, where, yeah, you know, um, can this be sort of a schoolmaster, a stepping stone, right? That, that was my last slide. Well, oh, okay. we don't want to... Um, use the term schoolmaster, right? can some legal set or institutional set of rules, guidelines, right, be some sort of stepping stone to some greater personal virtue or some other ethical realization? And I think, yes, there's deep responsibilities to the community outside the hospital walls or the clinic walls um, that can be part of that individual that improves the community, safeguards the community, but also what in what ways can the community come together to address some of the, the concerns we heard in the, the question before yours, right? I think that those are, those are things that at least we should keep in our minds, right? Also as patients, right? When you come in as a patient saying, I have rights, I have this, I, I, right? Realize that you're entering into a relationality there. Um, while, you know, I'm speaking to mostly clinicians, healers, um, it takes two to tango, right, to, to cultivate that relationality, right? And I think that's part of this communal idea, too. We, we often put demands on the medical profession and we say, give it, give it to me, give me the health care, right? But how can that be more of a doctor-patient relationality, right? Health care community relationality. And that's what's really at the heart of, of a relational communal ethics, and virtue ethics isn't just about my disposition now, it's how I'm relating to the world. So if we're all adopting a you know, virtue approach, it's necessarily going to flow into this idea of communal relationality and com group dispositions on that level.